Once we've collected and analyzed our data, we now have to interpret it. Surveyors know that the results they get are not 100% accurate. It's too time consuming and it's too expensive to survey every member in a population or to sample every member in a population. So we're going to figure out what's the difference between what that we call it the true value would be for the population if we were to get a result from every single member of our group compared to what were the results that we got from the sample that we generated. The difference between those two results, what the true value would actually be compared to the result we got from our sample is what we call the margin of error. How far off were we from getting this true value compared to what we actually got? That margin of error that we calculate can then be used to determine our confidence interval. This is a range in which the true value for that population would actually lie. And then how confident are we that that actual result for the true population is going to lie within that range that we just calculated? Are we going to get that same result if we repeat the survey or the study again? Are we going to hit that target 99% of the time, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, etc.? How confident are we that our results actually reflect that of the true population? At the bottom of a survey, you're going to see in tiny print something like the results of this polar survey were accurate within plus or minus 3.1%. Sometimes it's written like that. This is our margin of error. And then it's going to say 19 times out of 20 or something like that. That's where we get the confidence level from. So in this particular example, we get a result of 82% of the people surveyed support whichever candidate this happens to be. You're going to take the result we get. So this is the result of our sample. And then we're going to add the margin of error to it and we're going to subtract the margin of error from it. That's going to produce this range of numbers that we call the confidence interval. So the result for the true population, if we had the time money to survey everyone, would lie within this range. We might not get 82% again, but we should get a number somewhere in here. We can be confident of that 95% of the time. So 95% of the time, if we were to repeat our survey, we would fall within this range. And we get the confidence level, always represented as a percentage, by dividing 19 out of 20 times, we would hit this target again. For most university programs, you write a thesis to complete a master's degree or a PhD. This is the thesis my sister wrote for her master's degree. As her research took place in a country emerging from civil war and focused on improving an economic situation, it just wasn't possible or pertinent to obtain a high confidence level. At the start, it was agreed upon that she would report her results with 80% confidence. This is her PhD thesis, and it focused on investigating a particular medication to see if it could save lives. Due to the nature of that topic, she needed to begin with a much higher confidence level than just 80%. We're going to skip ahead to the very last page in our notes because it's really important that we understand how those three measures of data relate to one another. Our data is going to be 100% accurate if we can get a result from every single member of our population. That's often too much money and too much time, so we need to instead take a sample. The bigger the sample, the more accurate our results are, the margin of error is going to go down. We're going to have a result closer to what that actual result would be. The more confident you are that you're going to be able to get that same result repeating the survey, the more people you're going to have to survey. As we survey more and more and more and more people, we're going to get a more accurate result. Therefore, our margin of error is going to go down. Like my sister, researchers or scientists often start by saying, how confident do we have to be for this particular study? 95% is what you're going to see most often, but if it's a life and death matter with medication or something like that, you're going to have to be more confident. Now, the higher your confidence level is, you have to be careful because if you're going to say, let's say 99%, that means 99 times out of 100, if you were to replicate that study, you have to hit the same result. 99 times your result for the true population is going to be within that range. Okay, let's think about this. If we have a smaller margin of error, I'm going to have a range of four, let's say, percentage points. I'm going to add to, subtract to, this number here is four different than this number here. 
If my margin of error is let's say plus or minus five, now I have a range of 10 values. This number here is 10 units larger than this number here. Which target is easier to hit? Is it easier to get within these four numbers or is it easier to get within these 10 numbers? Well, it's gonna be easier to hit this target. For the margin of error, that indicates how wide or narrow that confidence interval comes. So the higher the margin of error, the more confident we can be that we're actually going to hit within that range again. So if I'm gonna perform like a drug trial and I have to be really confident that that result is indicative of the true population, I'm going to consistently hit with that same result again, I have to give myself a larger margin of error so that I can actually hit within here 99 out of 100 times. If my confidence level's not as high, 90 out of 100 times I'm gonna hit in here, that gives me, let's say, 10 misses, I don't need to be as wide, my margin of error can be a little bit lower. So we set our confidence level. The more people we survey, the smaller the margin of error. If we ask, let's say in our school of 1,200 people, if we ask 600 people, we're going to get a more accurate result compared to if we only ask 100 people. The more people you survey, the margin of error goes down. We're going to be closer to what that true result would be. Our lowering our confidence level, our sample size is going to go down. We don't need to survey as many people if we don't have to be as confident that their result reflects the true population. As our confidence level is going up, we're also going to have that margin of error increasing at the same time. It's a lot harder to hit this target than it is to hit this target. So the more confident you are that we're going to get that same result over and over, that this result reflects our true population, you have to widen out that target, make your confidence enter bigger, which means the margin of error is increasing. And finally, population has the greatest effect on sample size if you start with a small population. If we, for example, have a shipment of baseballs, if there's 100 baseballs in our population, one defect out of 100 is going to be not as noticeable as if we have one defect out of 10, if we only have 10 balls in that population. I know that's a lot of thinking. Here's how this works. We have a survey of 600 randomly selected people, and I'm guessing the survey was old because we found 76% of those surveyed between this age range have social media or some kind of social networking account. I'm pretty sure it's higher than that to date. You're going to start by taking that survey result, 76%. The margin of error is plus or minus four percentage points. So I'm going to add four and I'm gonna subtract four. This gives me my confidence interval. If we were to do that survey again, 95% of the time, we're going to get a result within this range. We are 95% confident that the true population falls somewhere in here. Now, you have to be careful because this particular question is not asking for the confidence interval. It tells us that this is the total population and what you have to do is calculate the range of people that happen to have a social networking account. So what we have to do is figure out what is 72% of our total population and what is 80% of our total population, that's gonna give us the range of the number of people. And when we do that, we can say with 95% confidence that the number of people who happen to have a social networking account between that age range would fall in that area somewhere between those numbers. In recent years, we've seen a number of prominent elections where the result has seemed to shock a lot of the broadcasters. But when those polls were conducted, there's a lot of variables that could have accounted for what happened. One of them is the interpretation of those results. So let's say we have an election and this is the number of people, percentage of people who say they're gonna vote for one candidate. This is the percentage of people who say they're going to vote for another candidate. They give us the margin of error and the numbers to determine the confidence level. So we're gonna start with the result for the first person and we're going to add and subtract that margin of error to get our confidence interval. We're gonna do the same thing for the second person. Now, who do you think is going to win the election? 
we're 95% confident that the percent of people who come out to support Smith is going to be somewhere within this range. And we're also 95% confident that those who support Jones, it's going to be somewhere in here, this percentage of people. The problem is there's overlap and I've drawn it on a number line just so you can see. So clearly Smith is more likely to win, but in here is overlap. So it is possible, even though Smith is more likely to win, Jones could actually be the winner. Moving from politics to sports, when you play sports, your ball or whatever equipment you're using has regulation standards. So in this case, we have a baseball and baseballs have to be within this many grams. One production company every day is taking samples of their balls and they're aiming to have their balls within this many grams. Now, why do you think it's not identical to this one? You don't want to be right on either end of what's allowed. You want to give yourself a little bit of room. So we're going to not make our range quite as wide. If we can hit within there, then we're for sure going to be good to go when it comes to the regulation. We already know that the more confident we are, the more balls we have to sample. If we're not sampling as many balls, we're not going to be as confident that our balls are actually falling within this range of masses. In the first question, we're asked what the confidence interval is, as well as what the margin of error is. I shrunk this down a little bit so we can see our target is to have 145 grams. That's what we've set the equipment to. So I'm going to start with that target number and they have given us that company's confidence interval. It's this range that the balls have to be within. So that is my confidence interval. Now to determine the margin of error, you're going to say, okay, this is our target. We can be a little bit over and we can be a little bit under that target. How much over and how much under is your margin of error? So we can see from 145 to 145.3, we've added three tenths of a gram on that side. It has to be the same on the other side. So let's check if we were to subtract that 0 0.3 grams, would we get this number? And in fact, we would. So when it comes to understanding what this table is actually saying, one example, I'll just pull one of them, is that if we want to be 99% confident that our balls are going to fall within that confidence interval, I have to pull 110 off that production line to sample them. If I only need to be 90% confident that my balls are going to have a mass within that range, then I need to pull 45 off of the sample line. So we can see that the more confident we are, the higher the number that we need to sample. And we're now moving on to golf ball production. The mean mass of golf balls at this particular factory is, is 45.6 grams within plus or minus 0 0.3 grams. This is our margin of error. I want you to pause the video and see if you can determine these three statistical measures. I guess I already told you this one, <laughs> but this is our margin of error. We're going to use that margin of error by adding and subtracting it to our target mass in order to get our confidence interval. And we are confident that 95% of the time when we pull a ball off the production line and take the mass of it, it's going to fall within that range. Was it likely that the average mass of the golf balls at this factory is 45.1 grams? 45.1 is just outside of that confidence interval. It's not likely because this is where the malls are likely to fall. Is it possible? Yes, it could be possible because remember, we only stated this with 95% confidence. So 5% of the time, the balls are expected to be outside of that range. So no, it's not likely. 95% of the time, our balls are within here, but 5% of the time, they could be outside of that. Yes, it is possible. There are so many examples, both recently in the news as well as famous historical examples, where major decisions, incredibly expensive, costing lives, have been made based on a misinterpretation of the statistical data. So I hope you have some understanding as to what we have to be aware of when we're looking at the results that are coming in so that we can make decisions that do actually reflect what the data is telling us.